All right, I think we'll get started here. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Um, my name is Andrew Merluzzi. I'm uh, an emerging technology advisor at USAID, and I work in the technology division on a research team primarily focused on um, emerging tech and emerging trends in technology. And I'm super excited um, to be joined by all these people you see on the screen here. Um, and today we're gonna talk about uh, zebras and, and unicorns. And if that's um, terminology you're not super familiar with, no need to worry, we will, <laughs> we will discuss all of that. Um, but just quickly, this is going to be, you know, a discussion-based session um, with all these different panelists, and I'll just uh, I'll introduce them quickly, and I'll talk a little bit about um, the topics that we want to cover today. So first is um, Keith Taylor. Keith is an assistant professor at UC Davis, whose research focuses on community economic development, policies and practices, social purpose businesses like cooperatives and nonprofits, and benefit corporations, and kind of the governance and management of communities and, and hybrid enterprises. So thanks, Keith, for joining. Um, next is Alexis Bonnell. So Alexis is a senior business executive and emerging technology evangelist at Google, um, former chief innovation officer at USAID, uh, where I work now, although, of course, we didn't overlap. Um, and Alexis was the chief of applied innovation and acceleration at the formerly known as Global Development Lab at USAID. Um, next is Joseph Chikota. Um, Joe is the co-founder of uh, Driven, which is a Zambian ride hailing platform. And the mission there is to end unfair conditions in the kind of gig for hire vehicle industry um, by putting drivers in the so-called driver seat of the platform economy. And then finally, Cameron Burgess. Um, Cameron is the founder and managing partner of Uncompromise, which is an impact consultancy firm, but recently merged with another organization called Sfera to form this new organization called Armillaria. I'm Cameron, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and the goal there is to help organizations and communities um, design, develop, deploy digital infrastructure um, for addressing their challenges, whether they be environmental, social, or economic. So with that kind of, with those kind of introductions out of the way, why are we here and, and what is this um, session all about? So much of this conference, and I was in person yesterday in DC, much of this conference has focused on kind of frontier technology, the, the newest of the new. So we've had conversations about blockchain and AI and all of these things. And these are all technologies for which the kind of legal and economic and societal implications are unclear. That's And that's why we're talking about them. But our question for this session today is more about who is developing the technologies and how they're funded to do so and kind of their goals in deploying these technologies. And specifically, we wanna focus on the role, the kind of business growth and maybe gr growth at all costs, um, how that kind of intersects with sustainable development. So just to lay out of the few questions I want to get at with these guests, um, you know, what are the costs of uh, kind of transplanting the Silicon Valley model elsewhere? What are the kind of incentives in venture capital? And are there, you know, situations in which venture capital, the incentives are aligned with sustainable development goals? Are there places where they're not? And conversely, how do other business models like cooperatives, where, you know, where can they provide the most benefit? Where do they fall short? And then in general, you know, the overarching question here is how can the development community kind of think about how we're incentivizing different funding models and the kind of innovation ecosystems that we're looking to build? So um, Cameron, if I can maybe just start with a question for you. Um, I think a lot of people might not be familiar with the term zebra uh, applying to a business. So can you talk about just what that means and specifically how that might contrast with the term that people are probably more familiar with, which is a unicorn. Yeah, I think the first thing that I'll say to quote Trevor Noah here, um, they're called zebras. Um, he, he says this says this to Americans, you don't have them, so you can't name them. Um, and so the organization is known as Zebras Unite, not Zebras Unite. Um, you know, the, 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 the founders who refer to themselves as doulas of Zebras Unite, uh, wrote two articles on, in Medium uh, several years ago. The first was called Sex and Startups, and the second one was called Zebras Fix What Unicorns Break. Um, and essentially, the, the, they were 
four female founders, um, two, two women of color who had all experienced trying to raise capital in the United States and the extraordinary challenges that they faced in doing so, recognizing that capital isn't colorblind um, and that it, as a general rule, aggregates towards white cisgendered men. Um, so, so initially, the, the articles were, were a reaction, and I think an understandable reaction to the dominant unicorn culture in Silicon Valley, which seems to champion scale at all costs uh, and doesn't recognize that there are people and entrepreneurs who are building businesses that are better for the world that aren't necessarily focused on these hockey stick returns. Uh, but are revenue generating, you know, revenue funded, um, have, a, have a business model and customers who actually like what it is that they do, and yet they have extraordinary challenges in raising capital of any flavor um, in order to be able to, to, to continue doing the work that they do. Cameron, all of a sudden we can't hear you, or at least I can't true for others i think he Welcome. stopped talking i did stop talking <laughs> okay i think he was done <laughs> yeah okay no no problem the the video is a little delayed for me but thank you appreciate it um and yeah actually so that i'm i'm glad you kind of ended where you did because i think it's a good transition to for a question for joe which is like you know this premise of like uh zebras or zebras depending on uh, where you're from uh is kind of like what you are trying to build something that is a little more um you know it's grounded in sustainability so joe could you talk to me about like with this organization driven that you you've put together um like why you kind of landed on a cooperative model for this and and talk about like what that sustainability means to you Okay, so uh, I'm not an expert on cooperatives, but this is sort of my, the way I view cooperatives in general, so I've got a few notes. So uh, cooperatives uh, are an approach to make the gig economy more sustainable and provide meaningful incentives for workers. Um, cooperatives can have a profound positive social impact as we consider the future for worker where fewer people are employed and, you know, uh, by traditional corporations. The past decade has seen the rise in the gig economy. We, you know, I think Uber probably all shed everything in anyway. So um, but so far, we've seen that it's it's mostly focused on profits. The the the, uh, it's the, the three the three components is the, the investors, we have the, uh, the 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 customers, and then the the, the actual gig workers themselves. Those uh, the priorities are given to the investors and the consumers, the providers, which is the drivers, are like in, in right share. They just not prioritize. The last thing that's looked at, and the most cases they are they are taken advantage of. Uh, then their lowest priority. So my 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 view of the world is that you know those are the people that need to be you know looked after because without the gig workers, the whole system would collapse. But these gig workers are so desperate that they are forced to deal with the devil because you know otherwise you know they have no source of income. So it's driven to try to sort of change that. Yeah, got it. Okay, um, and then maybe going to Keith here a little bit to talk about. You know, Joseph talks about like the basically incentives are not in the right place are not aligned with the interests of drivers and to me that that suggests like there's a governance model here which maybe in the typical kind of gig industry um, that we're all familiar with is maybe not not a sustainable one for the for the workers themselves so can you talk about like just from a management and governance perspective like how this might operate with a zebra oriented business versus a unicorn um you know kind of purely growth oriented business and kind of the implications of that thanks andrew um i think that, you know what, what typically happens in these arrangements is that when venture capital or money comes in in general uh, they'll view things like a cooperative as having all these extra governance costs because now you have more stakeholders at the table what i think folks aren't aware of though is that cooperatives have really done a lot of amazing innovations in how they do this in the governance space in order to control for those governance costs. So in many ways, a cooperative can actually be structured quite like an investor-owned firm. Uh, and it's just a lot of folks aren't aware of that. I think they tend to think that a lot of cooperatives are Athenian democracies where everyone shows up at the town square and has a voice. Uh, but that's not always the case. Uh, instead, what it is, you just have a lot more structures for a lot more, um, a, a lot more of the user preferences to bubble up to the top and express that voice. Mm -hmm. With that, you also have greater participation in the firm and you can have higher levels of performance. 
I think that's really important when it comes to something like a low margin enterprise. Um, you know, when I see things like Uber getting into the cab space, for example, I'm like, why would they want to do that? You know, it really isn't that big of a profitable area. Instead, you know, people in Joseph's sector, they're the ones that get disrupted in this. But the more that people are engaged and allowed to participate, the more you can actually enhance the performance of this. Uh, you see this with American electric cooperatives and credit unions and this sort of thing. And the other thing, too, is um, when it comes to the issue of scale, I do think that a lot of folks in this space think that local, because that's kind of what cooperatives do. They do a lot of local. They think local doesn't scale. But again, when you look at the more sophisticated cooperative systems, they do what I call scaling local. These electric cooperatives in the United States, this is one of my big areas of expertise, they can be very tiny little firms, but what they do is they form federations of federations of federations, and through those federations, they get that scale, they reduce their governance cost, and they make it where they can pull resources together in order to get more capital. A great example would be National Rural Utilities Cooperative Finance Corporation, big word, uh, but they go by CFC for short, and what they'll do is they'll pull the debt needs uh, the debt financing needs of their members, and they'll go to Wall Street and do a bond offering, which is really cool. And then who manages it? Not the individual co-ops. It's CFC manages that on behalf of them. So those are just some really quick examples of how cooperatives can sort this through. Got it. Love that. Yeah. So maybe there's a just this kind of the, the zeitgeist around it is maybe not right in the sense that it need not be just a local kind of small scale thing at all. And and maybe that is actually, maybe that kind of perception is, is maybe a hindrance to having this model be adopted in other places or in other contexts. Completely agree. Yeah. Um, Alexis, I want to turn to you. So um, you, have, of course, were formerly in the public sector at the Global Development Lab at USAID, um, now at Google, probably the quintessential unicorn of unicorns. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, I know we were emailing about this before too, but can you describe, you know, kind of what you think the advantages are of the focus on growth and kind of and big business and especially in the context of you know how you were thinking about all of this when at USAID too. Yeah, sure. And I think one of the things you know that I want to own is what what I got wrong right at, at USAID. I think it was a really interesting time over the last you know many years. Uh, and this is again looking at Alexis, not not uh, you know not uh, anything against the donor community, but I think there was this assumption as we were pouring so much money into innovation um, and into these different types of things that we just simply assumed VC would pick it up. Right, it would do well, and VC would pick it up. And yet, meanwhile, you know, we spend billions of dollars. If you just add USAID, you know, formerly with DFID, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, if you add it together, it's an incredible amount of money that is absolutely guaranteed to be spent in development. And so, for me, I think one of the big missing pieces was this idea that we adopted the VC model without actually understanding what our own value offering was. And I'll give you an example. I think for me, I was really. Uh, you know, really in love with, uh, you know, innovation, innovation supply, all of these incredible hero entrepreneurs. But maybe what I missed sight of um, was innovation demand, right? And what I love about, you know, what Joseph is doing and others is really this idea that we first and foremost have to be in love with the customer and see what customer value is, right? What will grow is ultimately what people want. And I think sometimes in development, we can, you know, we kind of fall in love with our sector right? And we say, okay, we're going to do health or we're going to do education. And what's ironic to me, Andrew, is that if you look, for example, at some work donors had done together in creating something like the Million Lives Collective, I think there's more than a hundred social entrepreneurs that each have a million or more customers that they are serving. I mean, they've already scaled, right? And so the question for me is if, you know, if development is going to be spending money anyway, on these critical issues, how do we actually make it easier and how do we make it as comfortable as possible to be incentivizing you know, customer driven value? And I'll give you two, three examples of things that I did not do that now being you know, maybe at a Google or kind of seeing some larger landscapes. I think it's very interesting and I'll end on this, that for example, we don't actually incentivize things like mergers and acquisitions or franchising or licensing and or, or cooperatives, right? In the way that's been talked about. And if you think about it, in many countries, there may be 
you know, 10 great health app or health different things that actually would be much more powerful together, right? They'd bring customer bases together, technology together. And I think it's a really interesting opportunity for us to ask ourselves in that development sphere, how do we incentivize these efficiencies, right? These strengths being brought together instead of maybe only thinking about um, kind of that hero entrepreneur journey. Um, and I think there's a lot of ways to do that, but for me, that's some of the questions that arise and looking at how almost really every other industry scales versus what we are doing maybe from a development lens. Such a great point. Um, and Cameron, I actually want to pick up with you on that. Like, you know, so you are working at a consulting firm essentially that is is aiming to help entrepreneurs, right? And, and a growing businesses kind of um, who are interested in social purpose and, and but also who want to make money, right? Like, can you talk about the, I don't know, just how those conversations go with you with um, growing businesses who are maybe seeking funding from one source or the other and maybe having to make decisions about, okay, do I look to venture capital? Should I look for an organization like USAID or a, another you know foundation-like donor? and just kind of the different incentives that will crop up for those kinds of businesses between VC funding, let's say, revenue-based financing, all of these different choices that they have to make. Yeah, I should probably clarify first that my company, Armoria, we describe ourselves as a systems lab for equitable economies. Um, we don't have clients, we have partners. Um, Zebras Unite is a global cooperative and it exists to support entrepreneurs that are building businesses for the, that are better for the world um, by providing them with access to community capital and culture. Um, so that's, that's, that's the distinction between, between those two things. Um, you know, I think that, that, I mean, just generally there is a challenge for, for a, a, a leader of a world positive organisation, which I think is a, is a better framing. Right, like we have a tendency to talk about entrepreneurs raising capital, but the truth is, is that the work of development, the work of changing the world, if you like, requires a multiplicity of entities, um, not any individual one. And there are various flavors of capital that are appropriate for different types of organizations. Um, so to me, like that's one of the critical challenges, right? Like when I, when I was doing actively doing consulting, I would frequently wind up in conversations with people who would say, I'm going to start a nonprofit to do X. Um, and my immediate response to that was, why does, why does your legal form lead the conversation about what it is that you're doing, right? Like, like what, what is the legal form necessary for you to do the thing that you want to do, right? And then out of that, that will determine the types of capital that are appropriate and that are available to you. Um, you know, I think that the, the, the challenge for, for, for the types of businesses and, and organizations that we're dealing with who would sort of view themselves as being impact focused is that, you know, the, the impact investing community, for instance, has fallen into the trap of trying to take a VC approach, um, looking to back winners. Right. And the, the, the biggest challenge with the VC model is that is how many bodies get left along the, along the way. Right. Like it's, it's sort of presumptive to say that VC backs winners, but that's actually not true. Like the winners win because VC keeps backing them to a certain extent. Um, and so if you are a relatively small organization or even if you're a relatively large organization and you're looking to scale, um, then it's not just about access to capital. It's about access to the right forms of capital. And, and there are always going to be questions around what strings are going to be attached to the capital that is being provided to me. And we spend a lot of time in conversation with funds, um, funds and foundations. And one of the things that we frankly consistently find ourselves saying to them is, look, we don't actually want your ideas. We want your money. Like if you knew better how to save the world and the people who are actually saving the world, then that would be the business that you're in. But you're actually in the business of shoveling money out the door. Um, and I think that there has a tendency to be this mistake that funders make and that also organizations and individuals who are seeking funding make that just because people have money that they're imbued with superpowers and somehow they know better than you who are working on the ground, how to actually solve the problem that it is that you're solving. So for someone like Joseph, and Joseph, I'm only passingly familiar with your organization, so I apologize for that, but I'm familiar with other organizations that are doing similar work to you. And these become really serious issues for them, right, around, well, what strings are going to get attached to the money that, that we wind up bringing in the door? Are we going to have to compromise our integrity as an organisation? Are we going to suffer from mission drift? 
right? Like really serious contemplations. And so Zebras Unite as a, is, is a global cooperative. And one of the ways in which they have handled this, that they have a 501c3 sidecar, which holds a golden share in the, in the cooperative, um, which means that, you know, that the intention is that will sunset over time so that more and more control will be ceded to the members of the cooperative. But in order to lock the mission in and to ensure that it doesn't drift and get dragged off course by, by the co-op members, um, the 501c3 is holding that share, which allows it to maintain control. Um, so I think that that's like the, the, the key issue is not access to money. There's no shortage of money in the world. It's you know, what devil do you have to deal with and how do you have to compromise yourself in order to actually gain access to the capital that you need in order to scale the success of your venture? And actually, yeah. if, if it's okay, um, Andrew, I'd love to kind of follow Cameron's comment because there's a one of the there's an amazing program manager at USAID who I got to work a lot with, and uh, there was a moment where I think there was a really interesting insight that we had along the way. And so, to Cameron's point, even when there was funding that went to a particular social entrepreneur, one of the things that often happens is that we might get measurement of success wrong. Right. And so in this particular case, there was an incredible entrepreneur who uh, had a um, weather prediction app and, you know, it had originally been set up that part of the measurement was going to be in essence to have as many people join this app as possible. Right. Which makes really a lot of sense when you think about the success of an app. And I, I respected this instance so much because that entrepreneur came to, to Cameron's point and said, you know, a couple months into that funding and said, you know what? I realize you're actually incenting me for the wrong thing. You're in essence incenting me to grow my users, not to serve them well, right? And so let's go back to the table and think about what value is, right? And in that case, you know, the program manager, you know, not only kind of navigated that, but actually really, um, interestingly enough, one of the measurements was people willing to pay for the app right after a year. And so when you talk about that idea of defined value, and I say that only because what I found so fascinating um, and such a moment for me was the fact of not many of our entrepreneurs or innovators, I think, are brave enough to go back to the donor or the source of funds and say, you know what, like this incentive structure actually is not getting what I think we both jointly want, right, or what is good for the customer and a willingness to come back and do that. And it was a real eye opener for me to kind of say, how do you create a space to be able to have a dialogue with someone that you're investing in so that they feel safe enough to come back and say, hey, if this is what we're trying to achieve, you know, I I've got to be able to make some tweaks on that with you. Um, and so I think that was just a real, a real eye opener for me. Super interesting. I know Keith, you were going to mention something about, yeah, go ahead, Keith. Yeah. So you know, to both Alexis and uh, Cameron's point, you know, Alexis, you know, what, I, what I like about that is um, I go back to the work of a uh, noblest Eleanor Ostrom, which she talks about is that the way that we structure our institutions can actually influence how people operate and you want institutions be structured in such a way that brings out the best in humanity. Now, to Cameron's point then too, one of the things that I'll see that's kind of ideological in this space with both our VC folks, but also with our co-op advocates, is they both presume that their institutional form is the ideal that you want to go with, that it's just going to result in a given outcome. So the VC crowd will say, invest your own, shareholders, all that, that's going to be great. Whereas co-op advocates will say, co-ops rock, they're going to change the world. Well, I actually like to point out a couple of co-ops that do some things that aren't so good. And co-ops are very lean and they're incredibly efficient. But let me tell you, if you're someone who's a vegan, uh, they're also really good at meat processing. And, you know, so it's to say like these are just hyper efficient firms when done the right way. What folks in this space need to do is start with the question of what are we trying to achieve? Then what's the proper institutional fit? And I'm speaking as someone who loves cooperatives, mind you. Plug in that proper institutional fit, and then that, again, to Cameron's point too, that's going to determine what sorts of capital you have access to. And I think that these are great kind of honest conversations that will make a more productive outcome. Nice. Yeah, Joe, um, can you touch on that? I know, so at the conference yesterday, I was like just blown away by some of the things you were saying about like, you know, like basically why the typical venture capital isn't working in Zambia where you are and like just what the deal is with that. Okay, yeah, just a little bit of some context. I, I, I've lived out of the uh, out of Zambia for the last 30 years. I've lived in the US and UK. So in terms of approaching the funding, I want to approach it as Zambia. I want to see the challenges that are seen from there. 
Uh, I don't want to use a US centric or Silicon Valley because if you use that, that lens, it doesn't fit. You know, it doesn't fit. So I think the templates, both from USA, from, you know, it's a big funder, from the uh, mission aligned uh, like partners or, you know, investors, they need to look at it from an African perspective. Because one of the things that, like, you know, the, the, the funding packages are just misaligned. They just need to be repackaged. They need to be broken down. Uh, for example, some of the funding I'm trying to get, I was been trying to get a small amount of funding. Nobody will give you that. Everyone will tell you it's too little, you know. And then some of the funding again, like from USAID, you I can't go to US government. You have to use these proxies who are profiting in between. So the you know, so your basically you, your message is lost in translation. Your request is lost. You know, they're not representing you. So the funding, whoever is funding, they need to have like you know have. Have a footprint in Africa, understand the context, you know, and then I think view the, uh, then repackage this funding as well as all the channels involved to make sure that, you know, when the funding is done, you understand the context that will be implemented according to, you know, the local market and conditions. Uh, one of the things that I've done before I launched, I went to Zambia and spent, uh, I spent three months or two months talking to the drivers uh, for several weeks before even launched. I mean, these are the ones who will pay for the incumbent understand the issues, listen to that. And their demands are very, very, very simple. The, you know, the things they need are very, very, very simple. But to get funding for me to implement the things that make them happy is just, you know, <laughs> I've spoken to people for a small amount is very, very, very difficult. You know, so I think, so the, the packaging needs to be changed, transplanting the method that works in, you know, in Singapore, in the US, everywhere else is, is not a good template. I think we need to start afresh, yeah. I think one other thing, if I can ask you, Joseph, because I'm struck by the fact that when any other industry, and this is one of the things that I've, I've been learning at Google, which is really interesting, you know, a lot of the question about investment is also about synergy, right? So it may simply be, I'm buying this because I think it's a great opportunity to get a return, but it may also be, this is really complementary, right? To other businesses I'm in or things like that. And I'm struck even, and forgive me if I'm getting this wrong, but when I think about your work, and when I think about, for example, uh, trying to have social impact or large funders who are really trying to contribute right, to better outcomes in countries, I'm yeah. struck by the fact that oftentimes, again, we take the sectoral lens, right, a health lens or an education lens. But oftentimes, what might be blocking someone from getting the health care they need or something in education or whatever, it might be getting there. It might be physical transport, right? And so for me to be able to look at the fact of like, you know what, it might be really synergistic to actually, you know, invest in drip or give credits or something to help that woman who needs to get to a maternal and child health appointment that might be just too far away. And so for me, I think there's this really interesting opportunity if we started thinking from that customer centric lens, right, from that same convenience lens, um, instead of maybe only a sectoral lens, we may find these beautiful intersections of synergy, right? that are really worth investing in um, and that most importantly actually make it all the more easy right for the people that we care about to take advantage of these and so I guess I say that wondering and asking you in that question if it's okay for me to be so bold and yeah, yeah. has, has anyone come and asked you to do that has anyone thought about you as a really critical interlay between so many other values and and things that are being made available in the local area um Maybe can you can ask a different way. So maybe can you ask another way? Let me make sure I, I guess, understand. No, I guess my question is if if you know if I was going to go back into my funding role, I'd be yeah. like, you know what, maybe investing in your company yeah. or buying credits or, or or rides with you in order to connect them to other services may be actually really valuable and appropriate investment for the type of social return I'm looking for. Yeah, no, I've not yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. I mean, I've not I've been approached, I think. You know, I think it's like the funders are so far away from the needs. You, you, you like, I mean, the way I'm approaching this is, I mean, I'm approaching from a Zambian perspective. Focus if they use the US, it's a different thing. But I'm trying to use seed from a Zambian list. Can I get funding? Because I think for me, solving that funding and having access to the funding market is is an important break. I think funding my business is one thing, but actually opening that door for others to be able to access the funding is one of the things I'm trying to do. Yes. So if somebody approached me, I would go, but nobody has approached me so far. Got it. Um, thanks, Alexis and Joe. That's that's helpful. And I want to turn to Keith. Um, Keith, I know you wanted to pick up on kind of what Alexis was mentioning about the synergy, but if you could also talk about just kind of from your perspective and kind of from a research perspective here, like what makes for like a useful 
enabling policy environment for these kinds of like hybrid organizations? And are there, you know, particular contexts or countries where you see though, like enabling policy, let's say working really well? Oh, those are great questions. Uh, so I'll start with the synergy and come back to enabling policy environment. Um, you know, wait, one thing that strikes me and being out here in California and being in proximity to the Bay Area is this conversation around ESGs and getting, you know, new startup tech out to market and all this sort of stuff. And there's this complete obliviousness to what the cooperatives and the triple bottom line enterprise sector is doing. Um, so when I think about ESGs, there's all this critique around these funds and what they're doing and how they're going out and justifying where they're investing their money. And I'm going, my God, if only you would just direct the money toward cooperatives and these other kind of triple bottom line enterprise, you're checking all the boxes and all these things. Um, the issue is that both the communities are talking past each other. So the VCs want to have that rapid return on investment at a high rate. Well, at the same time, they're, they're telling the general public they want to check the boxes for the SGs. Well, there's got to be some trade-offs here in that. Now, that said, the trade-offs to me aren't that big when you also consider that what you can do by enabling these new enterprises to scale is you get access to new markets. So I'll use an example um, in the United States, one of the things we're talking about quite a bit is all these new building technologies because a lot of our carbon debt is wrapped up in how we build new housing. But what do we have in the United States? We have a housing shortage. What's the housing shortage from? Well, a lot of policy but we also don't have a lot of businesses in this space. We have national companies like Lennar or regional <laughs> companies. If we would go out and back new, shall I say public benefit corporations to start this up and intake that new technology, now venture capital and their startups have a new place, a new market to take their stuff out to. So while they might not get a big return on their investment with the new startup, they have a place to sell their new product to, to demonstrate the proof of concept and they can penetrate the markets that's been locked in. So there's a number of ways that we could look at this and create different synergies if we had that open conversation. And Andrew, to your other point on the policy environment, uh, there's some phenomenal examples. That, you know, it's interesting, in the United States, it is the biggest cooperative sector in the world, but we have some of the cruddiest laws for cooperatives. So what it really says is we have some amazing entrepreneurs in that space. Uh, also, we had kind of, um, we had things like the Rural Electrification Administration that started the electric cooperatives. We had the National Credit Union Administration that was started. Um, so there were some key moments in the United States. But where I think of as having the best policy environment for this is Italy. Nor Northern Italy is just knocking it out of the park in what they're doing. Uh, they're able to kind of constrain the influence of capital, make it work, but they're involving the general public more in participating and investing. So if you go to one of their national grocery chains and you're buying your products, at the end of your sale, they'll, they will ask you if you want to buy a preferred share. It's a really cool way to get people to participate in that. And because of that, their uh, grocery and food ag co-op sector is really big. Uh, so I would look to Northern Italy. Um, there's also a group, Overseas Cooperative Development Council, OCDC.coop. Uh, they've created some wonderful policy guidance for uh, nations to pick up on and use as a blueprint for an enabling policy environment. Cool. Very helpful. Um, I have a, I'm going to go to a couple of questions um, from the members of the audience in the chat here, but then and then I'll ask a couple more of, of a few of you. Um, you know, Sarah is asking a question, or maybe it's Sarah, um, about kind of diversity of funders. And so decision made funders, I guess, who are, you know, designing these funding systems or coming up with their metrics about how they're going to measure success with a particular investment they're making, um, but maybe are not, I mean, very much to Joe's earlier point, like not designing the funding with the actual innovator or the entrepreneur in mind. So I'm wondering if anyone on the panel has any thoughts, maybe I'll, Joe, I'll start with you, if any, but just like, what would that model have to look like for it to be especially useful, that kind of like co-design of funding rather than this unidirectional, like I'll provide you funding and then I expect something in return? Yeah, so my, uh, the way I, this is something that we're trying to do is to try hybrid model. So what we're trying to do is instead of the typical uh, 20, uh, I'm not a business person, by the way, instead of this like, 2080 model of investment. We're looking at 2060, and you know, some percentage, you know, where some of it is reserved for members of staff. We have a percentage for the investors and then have some equity also reserved for the drivers. So if you reach certain thresholds in terms of rise or whatever service they provide, they actually get to own a part of the company. So looking at sort of a hybrid model, yeah. 
we'll get investors in, but also make sure that you know we have something reserved for the for the workers for the long term. Yeah, got it. Um, can can that, I throw something in there as well? Please, yeah, please, Cameron. I think one of the challenges that we see is in the funding landscape, and this is putting investors to one side and talking about funds, foundations, and philanthropists, is that they all have a negative 100% expectation of a return. Bar none. And yet they create all of these unnecessary hurdles for organizations to raise funds. Right, like basically all they're trying to do is shovel money out the door. Like that's actually what they should be focused on doing is getting money out the door into the hands of people like Joseph can actually do something meaningful with it. And yet there, there, there are just too many obstacles that get created. Now, investors have, have a different lens, understandably, because they're looking for a financial return and, and you know, it could be along a scale. Um, but when you're looking at, you know, a lot of the early stage capital, for, for organizations that are trying to do meaningful work in the world, a lot of that comes from funds and foundations um, and from philanthropists. Uh, and, and what they really need to be focused on is getting the money to people like Joseph so that Joseph can actually innovate um, rather than standing up all of these arguments as to all the things that he needs to do or do differently in order to justify getting money. In, in Australia, where my accent probably gives me away that, that I'm originally from, um, this was one of the things that we saw frequently in the growth of the social enterprise sector was that social enterprise organizations found it significantly easier to get money from a bank than they did to get it from any kind of aligned investor, yep. which is a real problem um, and, and really needs to be addressed. I think, I mean, two other things on that that are really interesting is really this idea that actually there are there's a lot of flexibilities in the different type of capital that can be worked with, right? And really thinking about that. So, you know what I mean by that? And this is where I'm just such a big proponent in figuring out how um, phil like philanthropy can start to see these social entrepreneurs as the vehicle in which they do business, right? Because what that does is two things. I think to Cameron's point, number one, when you know, for example, and, and you're able to get a, a contract or do, to be a provider of choice for something that you're going to be in the business of anyway, Way. Number one, it allows you to have, you know, to be able to show those contracts as major collateral for debt. And that's incredibly important, right, for growth. But the second thing it does is it actually allows you to show that for investors, right? So if I was, for example, an investor in real estate, I would want to see, you know, advanced lease agreements, right? I'd want to see advanced rental agreements as one of the things that I might be investing. So I think actually, you know, Philippoff, philanthropic funders have a real opportunity to signal by their use of social entrepreneurs as an implementation mechanism of value that actually they then de-risk for investors, right? It's very different to look at, at a potential opportunity and say, well, these, you know, these folks have $5 million of contracts with, you know, fill in the philanthropic donor name. Um, that's a lot less risky bet, right? Than, you know, a kind of we're doing good things in the world and you should fund us. And so I think, again, that idea of really thinking about there are things that we're going to do anyway on both sides of or multiple sides of that coin. How do you align them in a way that actually creates a confidence domino, right, to the to the best of that term, to allow these types of things to follow? And I think in, in many cases, you know, my own personal observation, and, and this is um, you know, owning something for myself, is that I think that really means philanthropy has to become truly comfortable with the idea of profit. Right. And, and the idea that if someone is getting value uh, as determined by that customer, that's OK. And what's been so ironic to me is that, of course, we know that philanthropic implementers make some type of profit. Right. And yet there, it, it's interesting when we talk about investment, or we talk about social entrepreneurship and profit. I think there's what we say we're comfortable with. And then I think there's being able to action, you know, real comfort with the idea that if uh, a woman in a village is getting value from this, then that's OK, you know, for that organization to make X profit the same way it is for a, a normal philanthropically implemented program, right, to make their overhead and to return as well. Um, Keith, did you want to pick up on a couple of points there? Yeah, you know, I really like Alexa's last point there, too. And I want to talk about the value line capital. Um, you know, on the philanthropy side, I, I would also group that in with social entrepreneurship. I think a lot of folks think that when you go into social entrepreneurship, you have to do it at, you know, next to nothing as a return. Uh, but I have this amazing example of the vet veterinary cooperative. It's a purchasing cooperative in, in the United States. And the founder, he himself is independently wealthy. 
he put money behind standing this up and it was essentially a franchise for independent veterinary clinics. He, he factored in his payout into the wholesale cost of goods. And what happened was he had to compete against the open market in order to make sure he was keeping his wholesale cost of goods down while factoring in his payout. He was successful though. After seven years, he grew to 14% of the veterinary market. Uh, and I think it was a $1.5 billion company when all was said and done. I'm pretty sure his cash out was in the tens of millions of dollars that he got in that model. But he, he'd recruit the members and they would say, you're going to get a big fat cash payout from us? He's like, yeah, but who's the stupid one? You're going to be the ones on the board. You're controlling this. And on top of that, he's like, I got to compete on the open market. And if I don't, you leave. I lose all my money. So very successful. He created uh, just a wonderful model. Uh, you know, yeah, it, it, Alexis talking about exit model. Um, my colleague, Nathan Schneider out of uh, Colorado, he talks about this concept, exit to community. And that's kind of the idea here. But the other part too, on the uh, you know values line capital and all that, I would really encourage folks to look at existing institutions as latent community capacity. And what I mean is in the United States, I, I get a little frustrated sometimes where people wanna start new things when we already have existing institutions that are supposed to be meeting these needs. What's occurred is over the years, folks haven't held them accountable and so they're not living up to their requirements. So we have a number of federally chartered uh, bank, uh, co-op banks in the United States, and they've gotten way more conservative. They're not taking a lot of risk. And they're actually supposed to take more risk to attract other forms of capital. And I think there's another opportunity there for a philanthropist to step up. And instead of hitting them over the head in the public and say, shame on you for not doing your statutory duties, I think they could start from an appreciative perspective and say, we know where you're coming from. We know it's happened over the years. What we'd like to do is put some of our philanthropy forward with you and help move you back into this space and align you. And the great thing is then philanthropy doesn't have to manage these dollars. They let the experts manage it on their behalf with the values line folks. And then they kind of stand up an institution, get it righted again, and you create new capacity in the sector. So and I, this isn't just in the United States. This is all over the world that a lot of these institutions aren't quite living up to their responsibilities yet. Uh, so I would very much encourage a more appreciative approach to engaging with them on that. Nice. Um, yeah, so we've been talking for the last couple of minutes about you know value aligned capital, but Joe, if I can turn to you, um, I know we were talking yesterday about this, but like in some ways, the thing you were describing to me was like that this is a values aligned business in the sense that the benefit is going to drivers and and, and I'm wondering if you can talk about like, from your perspective from Driver and like, what is the benefit going to drivers? And why, like, I don't know, what makes you convinced that they'll continue driving with this particular platform versus others, if others were to enter the market? Okay, sure, yeah. Uh, so a little bit of some context. So um, the ride share drivers in Zambia, uh, a good number of them don't, don't own vehicles. Uh, they are hand to mouth. They make the money they make every day is the money they'll spend that day to buy food and they come back the following day. And the way it works, there are people that are, you know, the bankers and the likes of me and Andrew <laughs> who can afford to buy five or 10 cars. You go and give to these guys. Basically, they kill themselves to fulfill their obligations to make a payment. In this case, like they're renting per day. They have to pay so much. So they spend most of the money they make, they actually to pay, you know, this person who's lending them the money. So the money from right here doesn't go to them. The day to day, they just barely survive to buy food. Uh, when they can't work anymore, there's nothing left for them. So what we're trying to do uh, in our environment is to to change that. So one is give them something for long for the immediate need for the food. Give them slightly more money up front. Then also in the long term, you know, uh, give them some equity so that you know when they're too old to work or they are unable to work, actually they can get something. Uh, then combined with that, we're working with some of the uh, uh, like gas stations to provide discounts. Uh, we the cooperative has you know a, a team of technic um, uh, auto mechanics. Well, okay, do the repairs paid for the co-op so that can, you know, they get the repairs and maintenance done uh, for free. Um, some of the other things that we are looking to provide is actually have a place for them to go and have some breakfast, have some lunch, freshen up in the day so they don't have to, you know, they don't have to worry about when they go home. So those are some of the things uh, that we're sort of trying to do uh, in this sort of uh, in the beginning. Yeah, got it. Um, and Cameron, maybe I can ask you, so I, you know, uh, I was probably much too oversimplistic at the beginning of this session. I've learned a lot from you all in the sense of like, I was portraying this as a, as a kind of a dichotomy, right? Like one set of, 
one business model essentially focused on growth at all costs and another business model. And mm -hmm. Keith like dispatched me of this notion early on in this talk, which is like cooperatives can also be focused on growth and can also be large and can also be, have this federated model. But Cameron, I'm wondering if you can just talk about like where you see, you know, potential middle ground here, like to avoid this oversimplification, what is the kind of middle ground and what, and particularly in the context of sustainable development, like what are the kinds of organizations, businesses, we should be incentivizing the models in particular? I'm going to answer your question by not answering your question. Um, so, so to, to me, like the, the whole challenge of the idea of middle ground is that it is, is that it is assuming that the ground that we're playing on is actually the right ground. And, and it's not, right? Venture funding of any form is destined to fail. Like we, we authored a paper, I was the lead author on a paper now four years ago called From Billions to Trillions. Um, and in it, we described a framework for helping to address the sustainable development goals. At the time, the best math that we had available told us that addressing sustainable development goals was going to cost $50 trillion. It's a sizable amount of money. Right. There is no individual entity that has $50 trillion. There's no individual entity that has the absorptive capacity to take $50 trillion. And even if you just take one of the SDGs, there are at best a $1.2 to $1.5 trillion problem to address. So to me, like the issue of, of, of funding ventures is that it's focused on the wrong problem. Right, like the problem is not the, the problem is not the problem. The problem that an organisation like Jota's uh, uh, organisation exists to address is not the success of his organisation. Right, like that is not actually the end goal. The end goal is not the success of the organisation. The end goal is addressing the underlying problem. Right, and that may happen in a variety of ways. It may happen through through the work that he's doing. The work that he's doing may branch out into doing other things over a period of time. But just funding organizations, one organization at a time, is the worst kind of magical thinking there is. It is mathematically, philosophically, and morally indefensible bullshit. Um, and it needs to stop. Like, we have to actually level up. We have to start thinking about, well, what are the structures and systems required to actually address climate change? As an example, like, arguably one of the singular most pressing issues facing humanity, and yet we act as if funding one organization at a time or funding, you know, like big think tanks or whatever is actually going to magically ladder up to addressing this global crisis that affects everybody and that everybody potentially has a handle in you know, or an opportunity to participate in addressing. So to me, like, you know, yes, there is a, there is a, a, a spectrum of finance that is available. Um, no question, and and it needs to become easier for organisations seeking funding to find those uh, sources of finance. But ultimately, if we don't have the necessary incentives and mechanisms to support organisations to cooperate and coordinate at planetary scale, everything that we're doing is a complete waste of time, and we are all going to go down the blaze of stupid. Uh, so yeah, Andrew, to, <laughs> Andrew, to add Please, to yeah. Jordan to that question, so. <laughs> You asked me what, so what are the things we're doing? Uh, so I, well, I'll say I, I'll include my wife, although she says no. So what I've done, we built a platform. It's in place. So it's up and functional. So what we're trying to do now is like, you know, we have this, like, you know, the driven or call it a corp or, you know, this entity, which is a hybrid. So it has a platform, one, it has management, marketing, customer service and everything else. So then what we're doing is like we go into each market. I mean, Uber goes into the market and whatever they do, what we're doing is we go into the market and say, you know what, we send up a co-op and say, a co-op, you're the, you're the members, we have the infrastructure, okay? We then have the co-op recruit the drivers, but they still get the benefit from, you know, we don't, you know, get shares that some of the, uh, they, they can buy shares, they can, you know, they get, you know, the share in the, uh, in the uh, what is it, the, uh, the commission, they benefit all that, but we, there's a, this bigger entity on top, which is driven, has the infrastructure. They don't have to worry about it, right? you know, the app and everything else. All that's in place. Marketing, the machine is in place. So we we sort of move like a superstructure where we've stood up this platform. We've been testing in Zambia. It's robust. It works. It's stable. Now we want to replicate by opening these co-ops in every location. And go open a co-op. Instead of opening an Uber branch, we actually open a co-op. It's empowered the drivers. They're in charge. They get involved. We have a seat. Each driver, you know, each cooperative has it. Cooperative has one driver on the management board to give us input. 
We also use the drivers in a co-op as you know, signal generators to tell us what's going on in the market. If the cost of gas for the trips is high, we know because they, they're doing it every day. So we're using them as you know, you know, as sensors in the market to tell us so what customers are thinking, the cost of fuel and all kind of stuff. So that's how we're running sort of we have this superstructure we trying to like build across Africa too, but we provide the infrastructure and the, the necessary business uh, 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 so uh, the business mechanics. If it's okay, Andrew, I'd love to follow um, the point that was just made and Cameron's point as well. One of the things that's been really interesting of having kind of two years to step back almost to a 50 yard line view, right, if you will, versus maybe being in the day to day, is this recognition that in, in many ways, a lot of almost all problems are information problems, right? And I find it fascinating, if we're going to circle back to kind of emerging technology as part of the theme of the conference. I find it fascinating at an age where we have so many millions, hundreds of millions of, of phones, for example, in Africa, that a woman can't literally sit there and say and geolocate the value that all of philanthropy and social entrepreneurship literally exists, you know, a block away. I mean, she should be able to say a block away is a is a healthcare, you know, opportunity from here or a digital wallet from here or what have you. That is how the rest of the world functions right now. And I think, you know, one of the most critical things to bring this together is to understand that if we are not willing to informationally vap or map the value paradigm across organizations, et cetera, it becomes very hard for an investor to understand what's already out there, what's not, what customer access do I have, what's not. And so I would really put out, you know, kind of a challenge to, to all elements of this community to say, we, we have to stop being passive aggressive about data and information. We have to be willing to bring that to one space and we have to do it with the intent of, of that woman in the village or, or any of those participants actually being able to find in a convenient way what they need, right? Because if you think about it, we're not going to achieve anything, as Cameron mentioned, until we're willing to come, you know, and have the information be collective. Um, so I, I think that's one of those things that is a no brainer with what exists right now in technology. But I think it takes a really a collective will to kind of not share of wallet, but share of potential, right? We're all doing things here. How do we actually make it more clear about how we're contributing to someone's share of potential? I'll add one more before I go, sorry, take up, or oh, before I, I give up. So one of the things that we're doing, which we did way in the past, we actually had uh, doctors on, doctor on demand. So, you know, the Gates Foundation, everyone, I'm not going to mention names, the Bill, 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 well, Bill the Gates, or is it the Clinton Foundation, they all send stuff to Africa. But, you know, in Zambia, they're between, I think, four to 700 unemployed doctors. They can, medical doctors cannot find a job. But yet you hear the Gates Foundation or the Clinton Foundation or whatever they are, they'll send money to Zambia for somebody to be cycling who's not a medical doctor. So why can't they fund driven, which, you know, we have a platform for qualified doctors, unemployed, they're willing to pay less, but they'll provide professional, you know, advice to these people in the villages, whether it's malaria, but it's like, where is the disconnect? Why are they spending millions on this sort of stuff, yet the stuff, stuff that's more efficient? And it's local, but you know, so where's the disconnect between you know the needs and some of the innovative ways to do it? And these people with fans who are there, like, you know, are they doing it for accolades? I don't know. What I'd like to add is that you know, to the conversation of scaling rapidly to Cameron's point, basically we've got a world that's burning, we need to hurry up and change as fast as possible in some of these ways. And then Alexis, your point about information access and all this. I love the example of how the credit union started, where you had philanthropy come in. Through Edward Filene, he put a million dollars of his own money in 1920 into what's called the Credit Union National Extension Bureau. They had 160 credit unions in the United States. And what they did through the bureau is they sent out technical assistance to help people stand up credit unions around the United States. And they would go out, they would set up federations, they would set up uh, enabling policies and all this sort of thing. So from 1920 to 1937, uh, with that million dollars of money, they created 5,500 credit unions in the United States. And in 1937 to 1954, they created an additional 21,000 credit unions. And they did that because they were able to pool all those resources. But along the way, they created support system infrastructure. I call it entrepreneurial support infrastructure. So you have these state associations, you have credit union service organizations, and that helps to sort and aggregate that knowledge and information. And it becomes an important part of why the credit unions are able to compete against the big banks along the way. So there's all these really creative ways that we could do these things. And just getting these communities to start talking to each other more, I think could be really helpful and advantageous. 
Love that. Yeah, the the synergy piece. I mean, Joe, your example just brings that out in in spades. Um, love that. Okay, we only have a, a like three minutes left here, so I'm going to do one closing question. If I can ask you all to be brief, um, just give me one sentence that you think describes you know a solution here. What we can do, right? So Cameron lays out this compelling indictment of the status quo, and we need to figure out like what to do in the future. We've talked a little bit about those things, but um, Cameron, maybe I can start with you. Just a, a sentence or two, let's say, about wh where we can go from here. Uh, stop focusing on, sh on on funding shiny new things is, is the first thing that I would say. Um, there's plenty of things that already exist that work. Um, the other thing is to give a lot of attention to data standards um, and the participatory design and governance of those standards so that information can actually be mobile across different systems. Love it. Excellent. Um, Joe, can I turn to you? Yeah, I'll focus just on the gig. So I think uh, I think it's to end unfair conditions of the gig economy through systematic change by putting workers in control of the gig economy. We have to put them in the front. Got it. Workers up front. Love it. Yeah. Um, Keith? I'll compliment what Joseph was saying by uh, saying that we not only we need to do we need to do that, but we need to be developing these institutions that support that and make it institutionalized going forward into the future. Got it. So enabling environment type question. Um, and then Alexis, bring us home. Sure. I think my bottom line is we have to re-fall in love with our customer not beneficiaries with our customer and help let them decide and let them action demand and tell us what value is and the rest of us should move to meet that. Awesome. Um, well, we're right at time. Thank you all for this discussion. I learned a ton. This is like part of the reason why I was interested in doing this is for my own selfish learning. Um, but yeah, super great to have you all here. Um, I thought it was an awesome discussion. We have tons of people in the chat. I know we had tons, more than 80 people online. So. Um, yeah, just want to thank you all again. Excellent. Thanks. Take care, all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, all.